Welcome everyone to this second fireside chat uh, from uh, IAFI, organized by the online events committee of IAFI. We are really pleased to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. We're going to begin very shortly. Uh, and before we start the discussions, I just wanted to um, introduce myself. I'm, I'm Hannah Szymborska. I'm one of the members of the IAFI online events committee, and I'm uh, here to welcome you with uh, Joanne uh, Combs Durso and Jih Jolly uh, from the committee. Uh, thank you once again for joining. So, this is the second of our fireside chat series. And today we're going to be discussing the feminist economic perspectives on mobility and migration in times of COVID 19. And we're going to be discussing uh, contributions on this topic to the recent special issue of feminist economics uh, on, uh, on the challenges of, of COVID and the uh, insights from feminist economics for our understanding of human mobility specifically in, in the the pandemic and after. And I'm very happy to introduce our speakers today. Firstly, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Yue Ping Sung, uh, who is uh, an author of one of the articles to the special issue entitled To Return or Stay, the Gendered Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Migrant Workers in China. Yue Ping Sung is a professor and vice dean of School of Sociology and Population Studies at the Renmin University of China. Her research interests include migration, health issues, and gender issues in caregiving and the labor market. Secondly, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Sarah Gamage from the Natural Conservancy, who is the co-author of the, the other contribution to the special issue entitled Human Mobility, COVID-19, and Policy Responses, the Rights and Claims Making of Migrant Domestic Workers. And Sarah Gamage is the Policy Director for Latin America with the Nature Conservancy. She has more than 25 years of experience working on gender and development in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. She has a PhD in environmental economics from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague and a master's degree in economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And then last but not least, I'm also very happy to, to introduce uh, Yun Junam from the University of Buffalo, who will be the discussant of today's uh, two contributions. Uh, Yun Junam is an associate professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Buffalo, the State University of New York. She holds a PhD in social work and social science from the University of Michigan, and her scholarly interests center around economic inequality and social policy. So with, without further ado, I would like to uh, pass uh, the microphone on to our moderator for today, uh, Stefania Marquina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you, everyone, for being here, especially Sarah, Junju, and Yue Ping. We're all honored to have you and hear from your expertise in such an important topic as human mobility and especially how has COVID-19 pandemic impacted this from a feminist economics perspective. And first, I would love to ask uh, Dr. Sarah, based on your research, what can you say about the economic situation facing migrant workers before the pandemic? In what way has it changed in the light of COVID-19? Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'm going to answer for a particular group of women migrants. Our paper focused very much on the context and the challenges that migrant domestic workers face. But just to set the scene um, and give some idea of sort of the, the global flows between 1980 and 2019, the number of global migrants more than doubled from about 101 million to 272 million. And women currently make up around about half of all international migrants. And they account for almost 80% of migrants from some key countries. So there are very gendered flows. They flow into different sectors, they flow from different places. Of about 150 million migrant workers, worldwide, about 8% are domestic workers. And if we just look at women migrant workers, that's 13%. But one in five domestic workers across the world are migrants, and that share rises to 83% of all domestic workers in the Arab states, 
71% in North America and 55% in Western and Southern and Northern parts of Northern Europe. So we really sort of hope to try and surface the essential nature of the work that migrant domestic workers undertake and its importance kind of sustaining patterns of high labor force participation for women and men in high income countries as they outsource a lot of the domestic care but also the demographic trends that are driving a lot of this sort of aging populations in need of more care so a lot of these trends prior to covid are unlikely to be reversed by covid but the impact of the pandemic has been quite significant for this particular group of workers. We have to remember that migration is really highly regulated, but it's also very complex and categorizing people is very hard. We have many mixed streams of economic and climate migrants, refugees, asylees, we have displaced persons, students, documented and undocumented migrants, temporary, permanent, all people whose rights and residency status depends on formal access to visas um, and in many cases we have highly contingent rights for those who are not documented and migrant domestic workers are equally mixed in their origins and status and have quite highly contingent rights to employment labor protection and statuses social security and health care so what we noticed when we looked at this population, and we did a, a set of interviews with key informants, subject matter experts, we also looked at the COVID tracker out of Oxford to see how the impact of lockdowns could have affected migrant domestic workers differently or migrant populations dif differently. Um, and what we found was that, um, that while the outcomes for women and migrant domestic workers in terms of their rights and enfranchisement and connection to social protection systems were very different, a lot of the inequalities were magnified through COVID. And our paper really explores the policy responses in that early phase of um, the lockdowns. And what we tried to do is surface the central role that migrant domestic workers played in resolving care deficits and care needs in many of the host countries that they're working in. And it was very clear that it, it played out very unevenly for migrant domestic workers. In some cases, they were literally expelled from their houses and left in limbo without any protections or even a clear route home and they, if they wanted them. In other cases, they were sort of became even more under the control of employers. So it really depended what their migration status was, whether or not the social protection system applied to them, how the social protection system was responding to the private houses where they were employed. So what we saw was a, a quite significant and uneven response in different countries that really magnified a lot of the underlying insecurities that were there before. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. And that really leads me into uh, my personal experience as well as a Mexican uh, women studying um, from a perspective of feminist economics. I see this all the time happening in this multi-level of inequalities, depending on you know, the migration status of domestic workers in the country and how employment in the domestic um, worker sector has plummeted during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I've been seeing Dr. Yunju um, moving her head in yes and in support of Dr. Sarah's um, responses. So Dr. Yunju, I would love to know your perspective on these unevenness and inequality that has affected migrant workers, especially on the recognition of essential work hasn't come with a recognition of people as essential because the worker has continued to be treated as disposable during the COVID-19 pandemic, huge unemployment surges. But you know, this double sort of double narrative of essential work and its recognition as fundamental to society and the um, and taking care of human needs, but people not be really being treated as essential as they should. Yes, I, uh, yeah, that's uh, like uh, the COVID-19 uh, like, uh, make the inequality um, the worse so that uh, I worked with the uh, like refugees in Buffalo and many of them are essential workers. So that um, 
but they were like a really vulnerable situation after COVID-19. One is that uh, uh, there was uh, no protection, especially for those without the um, uh, like uh, English the language resources, so that um, uh, so that uh, like uh, at the beginning they like uh, the Buffalo and all the United States there was uh, no information in the uh, no information in other languages. So, so because it is just uh, the like a very like it is really essential to disseminate the information quickly, but it was not uh, done that way for you know non-English speaking population here. So that was a big issue. And then also that uh, uh, that the other issue is uh, many essential benefits for the uh, the uh, like uh, was not the uh, Delivered uh, for the non-English, you know, speaking population, so that uh, uh, at least for the refugees, they will have access to the many benefits. Uh, so that the, for welfare, the social, you know, like uh, the public assistance program, that when they came, they usually have, uh, you know, help from the resettlement agency, but. The unemployment insurance, you know, the many of refugees did not have access to that, not because they are not eligible for that, because of that all the, you know, website, all the application is only in English. So they like, uh, you know, they were just left without uh, resources. So that, that I think that the, like, um, the like inequality by the language resources and language, you know, the is really like a different, like worsens during the COVID-19. But also I saw that uh, some resilience among the, you know, that the um, refugee and other like uh, disadvantaged immigrant population because they organize resources at the community level. So the community leaders, you know, came out and they just, uh, you know, visited like a door to door and then they helped them to download some watch app, you know, so that they helped the, use the technology and community resources. And then after that, they disseminated the information using the technology in their own languages. So that I saw that the big, contrast between the lack of policy intervention, but the positive side is uh, community worked for themselves. But as you know, that community, it is a very like low resource community. So even they, they tried their best, but there was always gap. And then the like uh, immigrant and refugees, you know, you know, left out, and then they are never been a policy priority because they are invisible, they are on the bridge, they are always excluded. They were the last from the policy, you know, pers the maker's perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Yun Yu. And that also makes me think about the digital divide because everything went virtual and, you know, calling the uh, unemployment agencies in each state of the United States is impossible. You're in line for hours and hours and for days and you never get a hold of anyone. Um, so on that light, um, Dr. Yu Ping, I would love to know your opinion about the new challenges that arose for uh, migrant workers and especially for essential workers as well as they compose most of them uh, in the light of COVID-19. Anything that you know, their lives as uh, Dr. Yu Yu was saying um, they were not mm -hmm. policy priority before, and with yeah. COVID-19 uh, pandemic and all of the resources available, that didn't change. But what changed for them? Uh, from my point of view, I mean, that, uh, let me uh, say something about the migration. I mean, maybe the COVID-19, uh, what COVID-19 has been, uh, uh, I mean, that it has changed. Uh, 
the migration, uh, especially from um, the gender perspective in China. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, how can I say, because uh, 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 in China in the, uh, in the uh, uh, past several decades, we could find that the mig uh, migration, especially from the rural to, to the urban area, a major phenomena in China. Uh, and uh, uh, in recent years, we could find that maybe uh, one out of six persons in China are migrants. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so, and also, uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, maybe uh, the outbreak of the COVID-19, uh, mm, uh, how could I say, uh, the, actually uh, last, uh, uh, last year it changed, uh, has changed much, uh, I mean, that to bring a very big change to migration situation in China, because uh, due to the lockdown, due to social distance, and uh, you see, uh, so, uh, and also uh, due to the lag, I mean, the decrease of the demand of the labor uh, in many uh, industries, that means uh, uh, concentrated uh, by the migrants, uh, especially for those uh, kind of uh, traditional uh, service sectors, and also uh, means that face to face, maybe face to face, and also uh, those in the manufacturing industries, or uh, I mean the foreign oriented uh, manufacturing industries. Uh, so uh, the, it affected the employment, yeah, uh, very much uh, of the migrants. Uh, and also, uh, so uh, some of them uh, had choose to have to, uh, ha had to choose to stay at home town because uh, because in China uh, uh, the outbreak of the of the COVID nineteen has just uh, at the same time of the uh, traditional uh, holiday. I mean the Spring Festival and. Uh, uh, traditionally, all the, most of the migrants they will come back to their hometown uh, to 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 get to the family uh, union uh, during the during the festival, right? Uh, but they, then they found that the uh, uh, some of them they could not be back to cities. Uh, even after the back to cities, they could not find uh, jobs. Uh, so and uh, so that's a uh, very big challenge, uh, uh, not only for themselves, but also for the Chinese government, uh, for the local government. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and then from the, from the, uh, from the general perspective, uh, there's a, uh, uh, from, uh, from our, uh, our study uh, found that there's a very big uh, gender difference uh, in the, uh, in the employment and also uh, in the, uh, in their decision to, to, to come back to cities or to stay at their hometown in rural area uh, due to several reasons, uh, uh, especially for women. Uh, the, the female migrants, uh, they, 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 uh, they choose to, st uh, most, uh, they choose to stay at home, uh, I mean, uh, at a higher, higher uh, percentage than, than their uh, male counterparts also. Also, even after uh, they come back to cities, uh, their employment rate are significantly lower than their uh, male con counterparts. So, uh, and the, so that's a very, uh, very big challenge. Uh, you see, uh, you see uh, uh, the, actually the, I think that the female migrants, um, uh, they benefit them much from the migration and they benefited much from the urbanization in China because then they could find a, a better uh, situation. I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, a better paying employment in the cities before the pandemic. Uh, and now they, uh, some of them have to return to their traditional uh, uh, family roles to take care of their children in the rural area. And even after the, uh, they stay at home in the rural area, they, they have a lower possibility to, to, to go out to find uh, uh, a non-agricultural uh, jobs in the, in, even in the rural area. 
So uh, that will cause, uh, an, you see, uh, come back to, come back, there will cause a uh, big gender difference, uh, 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 even for those, uh, even, I mean, that all the migrants are much more vulnerable, right? But to the female migrants, they are even much more uh, vulnerable uh, uh, due to, uh, due to the due to man due to the decrease in the uh, in the labor market and uh, that's the result we found the last year and uh, to the latest uh, we we uh, after one year we conducted another another survey now and uh, the primary uh, results show that uh, even uh, yeah the gender difference uh, still exists uh, uh, in the much more, I mean, a longer, as a longer, uh, in a longer run effect of the, of the pandemic uh, to the labor market in China, so. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu Bing, and really the changes in the world of work has affected women, and especially women migrants, much more. And your, um, all of what, all the insights that you were giving today really give light on the intersections of how the COVID-19 pandemic have affected um, different people in different ways. And you know, all of the United Nations report agree that in gender equality, we've lost more than 10 years of advances in the past pandemic and how we respond to it will really um, put the mark of where we're going next. And this really brings it back to our field of study, feminist economics, and what the all three research and the challenges to make um, articles as the one published in the two issues of the Feminist Economics Journal, the special issue on the COVID-19 pandemic effects. And I really wanted to ask and know more about the challenges that you face as researchers. Uh, Dr. Sarah, I will ask this to you. Uh, and within uh, the special issue of the Feminist Economics Journal, the editors have uh, outlined that there are several crucial gaps in studying the gendered impacts of this pandemic. You know, the lack of the aggregated data, data for gender, absolutely you know, very little intersectional research, and the need for more cost and benefit analysis of these approaches as well. So were there any particular challenges of researching this topic, especially when it regards to human mobility for you? Oh, great question. So yes, there were. I mean, first of all, we did this very quickly in response to the immediate crisis and the lockdowns. Um, we sampled out through networks of unions, NGOs, service providers, UN organizations, and we did subject matter interviews. We did, we could not ask people about their individual circumstances because we didn't have a human subject protection protocol in place. So we used the networks that we had and we sampled across some of those key migration corridors that were important to us to see what the outcomes were for domestic workers. We also sort of cross-checked with um, media searches, to see what was coming up um, and to try and triangulate that. But fundamentally, data are really scarce on migrants and particularly on migrant domestic workers. And sex disaggregated data is even more scarce. Many of these flows are invisible. Others are highly regulated and people's migration status changes and they change employment and sector fairly fluidly in some cases, or they're tied to their employers in other cases. But there's a real challenge in terms of the invisibility of these workers and the contingent nature of their employment employment and precarious nature of their employment. So getting any visibility on that is going to be heard in quantitative terms. Um, the ILO has among the best set of data that we have on migrant domestic workers, and this we know is out of date. Um, we've got data from IOM, we've got data from the UN system, we've got some data from national household surveys, some sentinel data from healthcare providers, but it's really patchy and complex to try and use. So the lack of robust data led us to use a certain type of approach. We were clearly trying to look at the role that migrant domestic workers play in providing care in a context where we knew care was being 
squeezed, where households were being squeezed, where there'd been a retreat of the state, where mechanisms that usually provide care for elders and children had completely collapsed. So how did that affect migrant domestic workers? You know, were the ones who were dependent on employers and live in, did they become more dependent, more precarious? Did they get paid? Did they have access to PPE? We tried to ask all of these questions to really sort of surface the critical nature of the terms and conditions of their employment. We also wanted to try and, and relate it to bigger questions. And we had a, a great hope that we would be able to generate information about how the size of the social protection system and sector and whether or not it targeted migrants and particularly migrant domestic workers or whether care was in that would be clearly relatable to the types of public health measures and lockdowns that were taking place. So we tried to use the Blatnovic School data on lockdowns and relate it to size of protection systems. I think um, Smriti Rao has done some really great work on this in terms of lockdowns can't be stingy. Um, or, you know, you, you need to have a social protection system to keep people in place. Otherwise, the earnings imperative drive people out to work. If you were stuck with your employer, you may be even more precarious. We're not going to capture a lot of that. Or if you were thrown out onto the streets because the employer couldn't pay for you anymore or had no support, where did you go? Or if you weren't a live-in migrant domestic worker, but you lived in your community, the lockdowns often hit particularly hard, poorer communities where many of the migrant domestic workers worked. So we had a really hard time getting those data. And we had hoped actually to do a sort of Q squared analysis where we could take the qualitative data and really interrogate a sort of quantitative model, but the data just aren't there. And then finally, I think sort of the other issues that are really important as we think about the scholarship, feminist scholarship, you know, surfacing the invisible, placing care at the center of the discussion, analyzing our social protection systems through the lens of care, analyzing the gender division of labor through the lens of care. This is really important. And this is even more so in, in a pandemic. But, you know, you've got to try and surface these stories in a way that are completely respectful of people's, you know, you know, their, their own anonymity and that observe human subject protection protocols. So we did not have one to be able to do bigger sets of surveys. So we were sort of stuck using a particular methodology, which gives you an incredible optic into what's going on, but it isn't necessarily sort of quantitative in a way that might be more persuasive. So it's often very easy to attack more qualitative studies because people will just say, well, how do we know that's representative? Is it just, you know, maybe it's just a few cases, a few outliers. And so the challenge with the methodology in this moment is how do we get the story out there in a sufficiently robust way that tells the story of what's happening, but also surfaces the claims making, the organizing, the creative strategies that migrant and domestic workers and their allied organizations are doing to change the narrative, to protect their rights, to roll back the sort of really negative impact on the uh, migrant domestic worker groups that they represent. So anyway, I think in general, we are challenged by a lack of data in our field anyway, and in a pandemic, even more so. And when you're talking about migrants, we have a very spotty set of data. Um, but I hope that we can continue to build more robust data sets, but also build more robust methodologies that link qualitative and quantitative in ways that interrogate both. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. And not only for your very comprehensive answer, but for all that all of you three do in such a challenging uh, field of study to continue to research and point fingers at the sensitive questions that exactly put care in the center of analysis and that strive to change the narrative in economics itself, in methodologies and in the acceptance of this as knowledge. And you know, especially when traditional methodologies work, as you said, with very comprehensive data sets and so on, and if we don't have that, we need to change that, not only in the availability of data, but in the acceptance of knowledge being created with the limited data that we have that validates women's experiences and all of the gender spectrum and intersectionalities. So on, on that, I would love to hear from Dr. Yuping about the feminist economic approach 
does it improve the understanding of human mobility and migration? You know, this care lens in the specific light of the pandemic, how does feminist economic change that narrative or brings into the arena of discussion a more comprehensive perspective or of migration and human mobility? Uh, so uh, before, uh, before uh, I, I turn to, to this issue, I want to add some, some of my thoughts of the data collection during, I mean, especially for the, for the, for the gender from the, from the uh, gender perspective. You see, uh, in China, because uh, 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 during, uh, I mean, uh, last year, maybe, maybe in, in March or, um, oh, yeah, maybe in April, actually there are some researches about the, about the chain, about the change in migration, uh, uh, or yeah, uh, or some kind of uh, estimation or prediction of the migration uh, uh, after the after the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, but uh, most of them are, are based on the big data approach. I mean, yeah, uh, you see from the cell phone or from from other or from the uh, from the uh, highways, some something like that. But uh, you see, uh, we could not find any kind of, uh, we could not find uh, any. Uh, I mean, that uh, to 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 see the gender segregated uh, 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 data. Um, so then that's why uh, why we uh, uh, I did such uh, did uh, you see uh, a survey a follow up survey uh, uh, to to by phone and to 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 want to uh, want to see uh, that's uh, why uh, we wrote our paper. It is it was very difficult for us to to. To conduct to conduct a survey, uh, and you see, we could not uh, uh, because because uh, even for the for the phone a survey, we 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 have to hire, we have to collect, we have to get someone uh, to to uh, to sit in, uh, to sit before a desk and to 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 do the survey right. It is. It was very difficult for us to to, to find. Uh, you see, you see, especially uh, last year in, in March. Yeah. So I think that uh, we have to we have to find some way to 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 collect uh, high quality data uh, by some kind of uh, new technology or new 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 approach. Uh, so uh, we developed a kind of uh, uh, we developed a kind of uh, uh, how how could I say uh, a survey system, and we hire we hire the the interviewers everywhere in China, and uh, we could uh, uh, we could supervise uh, what they do. Uh, and to do the to do the survey um, by phone, and then uh, that uh, so last year we 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 conducted several uh, several waves of the of the survey to 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 see the impact of the COVID nineteen on their lives. Uh, I mean on the lives and on employment and and also. Yeah, maybe uh, several other topics uh, last year, uh, and then get some new information. I mean, very uh, 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 to 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 want to want to see. Uh, we want to. Uh, I mean, very in time. Yeah, uh, so uh, for the yeah, so that's what we did. Then to 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 your question. Uh, uh, how do the feminist economics approach improve our understanding, right, uh, to uh, to issues of the migration? I think that uh, from uh, from my own uh, experience and from my own understanding uh, for the uh, of this uh, of this paper, and uh, that mean I mean that uh, the. The pandemic, I mean, the epidemic, uh, they just uh, make the things much more, uh, I think that makes things much more uh, difficult for, especially for women to make the decision. Uh, uh, you see, because uh, uh, when, when the daycare center are shut down 
and when schools are closed, then who to who take care of their babies and who take care of uh, and uh, especially uh, when they face a very sharp decrease of their income, then I think that uh, lacks the support not only the public service but also the economic support. Uh, for those uh, for those low income families, I think the gender difference will be will be a uh, very big uh, uh, issue, uh, and also uh, so then the women will uh, will be encountered with uh, uh, not only uh, not only the the, the uh, will 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 be encountered with a uh, very. Um, much more difficulties to 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 uh to to make decisions uh, or to stay at home to take care of their babies or to or to uh, maybe their maybe this is their own uh, only uh choice so uh, then the on the other hand uh, the 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 uh the the situation in the labor market will be would be much more uh, uh, difficult. I mean, scars the opportunities for them, for their, uh, for women. Uh, so uh, you could find that uh, their empowerment. I mean, their situations, uh, the domain, uh, such as they will be encountered with much more domestic violence or something like that uh, in their families, uh, and uh, also. Uh, there are some studies uh, uh, in China. They also found that uh, increase in the domestic violence against women in China, especially for those kind of low income uh, from the from the low income families. So, uh, um, what we should do, especially for the policy implication, I think that. Uh, uh, we have to we have to take much more uh we have to pay much more attention to to um to 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 women uh in the uh how can i say in the uh, lower uh, class or the lower income uh, a group uh, to protect their own uh, to protect their uh, 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 safety and also their uh, uh, to 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 ensure their uh, uh, survival. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu Ping. And um, just before we go into the next question, I love to invite the public to think of questions for the panelists today. We will have about ten minutes for questions at the end. So please start thinking about them and address them in the chat to the host. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, put them on the floor for either panelists to answer. And Dr. Yun Yu, uh, speaking about policy challenges that Dr. Yu Ping just put on the floor, we've talked about many challenges of human mobility of migrants, especially women migrants, on um, social security access, on health services, on the huge changes we've seen on the labor market. Um, you know, remote work being not accessible for essential workers. And of course, as you said, the language issue and not being a policy priority to deliver multiple languages and accessing to programming and benefits, et cetera. But I'm hoping there's also opportunities arising from this pandemic for policy changes. So on that note, what kind of policy should we strive and should we promote as feminist economics in the sense of human mobility and migration? I think that uh, like we, at this point, we need to raise questions about the fundamental approach to, you know, migration, you know, the, and refugee issues, because that um, like most, you know, in most policy, the target population is immigrant, immigrant and pop, like uh, refugees. They like uh, try to like fix, you know, immigrants and refugees, you know, problem like uh, that um, 
you know, immigrants, you know, and refugees cannot speak English well. So let's, you know, teach them, you know, like the immigrant and refugee have some like gender role, strong gender role, you know, the ideology role. So let's, you know, change that. But we need to think about the host countries, you know, perspective on immigrant and refugee. You know, we, we never thought that the, our targets, you know, policy target population may be the host country, culture or perception. So that the, like uh, as uh, uh, Sarah and Yuping uh, already say that the COVID-19 show that gender role divide more clearly. So many women uh, came back to, you know, the, you know, home, you know, because of the, you know, care issue. So there was uh, some gender, you know, like role ideology and divide. And then many, you know, host country, you know, policy makers or like service workers, they think that it was a more like, a, you know, like a salient among the immigrant and, immigrant and refugee community because their society, their culture have a more strongly influenced by traditional gender role, but they never ask. And when I interviewed the refugee women, you know, even though like they came from the, you know, gender, you know, like a very strong, like a gender role, like ideology, they wanted to work, they wanted to get education, they wanted to be a more independent, but they were never asked. And then the, like, uh, the, when I heard their experience, like many women, you know, the refugees say that when they met the, you know, resettlement agency workers, you know, like with their like uh, husband, and then the, and they have a small kids that uh, like they put the, you know, the husband in a like employment program or like English, you know, class, but they just leave the woman in home because they need somebody to take care of children. They never ask the woman. So even though they think that the immigrant refugee community have, it's a perception, you know, they have a perception that the immigrant, you know, women or refugee women, they are deeply influenced by traditional gender role. They probably have, a, you know, you know, desire to stay home. So, but, you know, it's not. So that uh, we may need to, you know, like develop, you know, some policy to support and empower immigrant refugees, but we also need to think about, you know, how we think like uh, that host country's way of thinking about the, the immigrant refugees, and then whether we are just imposing so-called gender, you know, role ideology on the immigrant and refugee. You know, it's not only inside, it is also that outside of like a host culture, how the host, host country, you know, treat the immigrant refugee women. Thank you, Dr. Hyunju. And absolutely, I think I fully agree with the policy side should be on the host country's responsibility and changing the narrative of how we treat migrants and human mobility overall in the light of their essential contributions to sustain human life with that care lens. So it is not a burden on our care and social security and tax systems. They are an asset to sustain uh, every and generational lives, especially in the crisis of social reproduction and the care crisis and demographic changes and age, aging and so forth. We do have a question for, from the public that I would love to pose to the panel for whoever would like to answer. And it is from Elizabeth Villagomez. She is from Indonesia. And she asks that um, there should be a better monitor, monitoring of migration for domestic workers, and it should be expanded. And at secondary school attendance has increased in the areas where domestic workers were mostly sourced 
to the Middle East in particular. So there is increased benefits of domestic workers that are migrants from the Middle East in Indonesia. Uh, is there any um, reflections or insight of how to better monitor migration for domestic workers in data flows? I see Dr. Sarah unmuting herself, go ahead. It's a wonderful question. Um, I think there are many opportunities to do so. We have to also remember that there are state-led flows. There are places that are actively recruiting women to send them abroad through state-sponsored systems that even certify their skill sets and they target them very specifically at jobs. And so there are some state-sponsored systems that could be doing a far better job of tracking the migrants that they support in that process. I think that we one of the things that we learned from our study was the extent to which consulates were present or stepped up or provided information or responded or, or home country governments engaged to protect workers who might have been displaced or stuck in transit or expelled from employment also surfaces the potential for the home country governments to use their sort of diplomatic structures and consulates to provide support to their populations abroad, their diasporas abroad, but also to ensure that they're tracking what's going on. These home country governments can also be sort of protagonical in the way they engage host country governments about the treatment of their workers abroad. So I think there are opportunities to provide more information along the way that is consonant with the rights and claims making of the groups of workers that we're talking about. Just to reflect also on the point that Elisabeth raised about remittances being critical for family welfare and well-being, we know that they're invested hugely in consumption, in nutrition, in education, in rebuilding houses. Remittances flow back to the households that have invested huge amounts of money and time and sacrifice in sending people abroad. Um, and they are invested in the welfare and well-being of those families and migrants abroad, whether they're domestic workers or construction workers or you know, whatever sector they end up in, are clearly actively engaged in being transnational families as well. We know that that's a critical role that they play, funneling back remittances, trying to stay in contact with families. They do it now in different ways, through different platforms, WhatsApp, Facebook. And one of the things that we did notice going back to the discussion about data is the critical role that sort of these technology platforms are playing in organizing, in articulating the voice, in channeling services, in making sure that people know about other um, you know, migrant workers in similar situations or getting access to healthcare or food or some kind of social programs. So there are opportunities to use these platforms as well to gather data. I think we do need to think about the ethics of this and the sort of the anonymity of the data and respect the fact that in some cases, particularly for undocumented workers who are very precarious, we have to understand the implications of making these flows visible as well. So I think there are some bigger issues that we need to parse through or tease through as we talk about how we collect the data, how we make it visible, how we make sure it's anonymized, but how we provide more visibility into the sort of critical human mobility that is underpinning care systems and social protection systems globally. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. And speaking about monitoring evaluation, we have another question on this topic from Nitsa Segui, the Latinas en Poder from Washington, DC. And she's asking, what indicators should we focusing on? Uh, we, Dr. Yuping or Dr. Yun Yu would have some insights on, on the specific indicators that outline human mobility, migration, absolutely with a gender and care lens. So uh, about indicators uh, to see the migration. 
Wow. Um, it's a tricky question. It's yeah, <laughs> complicated. Uh, yeah, very complicated and also uh, confused. Uh, I think that uh, for the uh, participation uh, of uh for me uh i will uh i will pay much more attention to um uh, to the uh their uh labor force but uh also uh yeah uh for the migration uh first um i will uh i will uh pay much more attention to their uh participation in the migration Something like that, because uh, I think that uh, if the uh, if they can uh, uh, one, I mean that uh, if they can leave their home and uh, I mean they can uh, they can migrate from from their hometown uh, to other place to find a job. I, I mean that uh, that's a success, right? And another one is that to 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 uh, to see their uh, have, uh, to see their labor force participation rate uh, to because uh, the gender difference uh, in uh, in their uh, in their employment situation will be uh, will be a very important uh, aspect uh, of their of the gender difference in um, I mean uh, of the gender difference in the in their uh, economic uh, perspective. And also uh, now, as uh, as the family migration in China is a uh, is a very is a major uh, I mean uh, a very big uh, phenomenon, right? Uh, 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 I mean, uh, on average, uh, the husband and uh, and the wife and they will bring their uh, children together to the cities. Uh, 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 to live together and uh, then to 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 we we could as a kind of uh, family migration. So another indicator is uh, uh, the scale or the structure of the of their um, uh, family. I mean, uh, family of the migrants. Uh, that is a very uh, uh, interesting and very useful indicator to to uh, to see if. Uh, uh, you see, uh, to see the welfare status of the of the of the migrants in China, and another one uh, I want to is I want to address is the uh, is the coverage of the uh, social uh, uh, of their uh, social security, uh, some kind of the uh, the medical insurance, uh, social medical insurance, and also uh, if they are covered. If they enter uh, the local, especially the local medical insurance, I mean in city, because uh, uh, then it's uh, it's also a very uh, useful indicator to see the uh, welfare status of the migrants in China. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yuping. Definitely understanding their labor market participation, their family structure, and their access to health and social security yep. services is key for to make a diagnosis and, and an assessment of their opportunities. There is a quick follow-up just on, as Dr. Sarah was also saying, it's important to understand the double flow, right? The host countries and also the sending countries that receive remittances and that also receive migrants back. And that also poses some dangers and difficulties for people to fit back in and et cetera. It's just a bit of a reflection as we are heading into the last five minutes of the session. Uh, Dr. Yun Yu, I see that you have some ideas in mind. Please go ahead and share. Oh, yeah. I totally like for the indicator, I think the market and then the social security health insurance are really important indicator. But for the long term economic success on security, we also need to think about asset and wealth. So that like, because when people have some emergency savings, when people have uh, savings for the retirement, you know, and then when people are able to save, that also indicate that their like uh, current economics, you know, activity is uh, like uh, successful. So that the like, uh, in, in addition to the floor in the like income, 
we also need to see the savings and the asset like home ownership, you know, et cetera, because many of migrant workers came to the host country to save money and then they can build the new life in the host country or the, their home country. In order to do that, they need the savings. So that is also good long-term indicator. And also, I think that also that in addition to the objective measure, we also like subjective measure is also important. How confident or like how comfortable they are thinking about their own evaluation of their own economic conditions, current and near future, and then and the long term future. Like uh, how comfort, comfort, comf, confident are you to? you know, finance your kids' education, how comfortable, how confident you are about your retirement. So that the uh, like objective and then the subjective also the short-term and long-term indicators. Thank you, Dr. Junju. Definitely, I fully agree that we need to know if migrant uh, workers are achieving some sort of financial security and asset building and how that impacts both their life in the host country and the life of their home country. It's time now to close. I really thank you very much, Sarah, you being you, you. It's been an honor to hear from your expertise today and so enlightening for future research as well. Just a friendly reminder before we leave today, today, April 8th, is the deadline for the call for papers for the annual IAFI conference, which will take place in June. So if you have a paper or a specific conference or panel that you might like, go ahead to iafi.com. He will put the link in the chat right now. And we will hope to see all of you again in the next fireside chat session. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks very much.